Hello and welcome to Astronomy with Mr Gerin. I recently passed 100 subscribers on this channel. Thank you everybody who subscribed and extra special thanks to my wonderful GCSE class who made this gorgeous 100 subs play button. And since I'm no doubt about to pass Mr Beast and PewDiePie, I'm compelled to make a 100 subs special. This video isn't part of the GCSE course. Voyager has been in the news lately with claims that the programme is shutting down. This is inaccurate. Every few months, some journalist without a scientific background reads something about Voyager, misinterprets what they read, and writes a flawed article which then gets picked up by other news channels. So let's uncover the truth. In the 17th to 19th centuries, the Grand Tour wasn't an Amazon Prime series, but a tradition among young upper-class European men of touring Europe for a few months or even years. Then, in 1964, Gary Flandreau at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory revisited the name for a space mission. Every 175 years, the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, come into a special alignment. The planets aren't in a straight line, but are organised in such a way that a spacecraft from Earth could visit each in turn using gravity assists from each planet to propel it towards the next one. The next alignment would occur in the late 1970s. Two missions would visit all five outer planets. One would visit Jupiter, Saturn and Pluto, and another would visit Jupiter, Uranus and Neptune. The cost was estimated at $1 billion, equivalent to $10 billion today. Congress noped out of that immediately. But if we didn't go soon, we'd have to wait until the 2140s for another opportunity. So NASA proposed a much cheaper mission, based on existing technology, the Mariner probes that had already proved themselves by visiting the inner planets. They'd visit just Jupiter and Saturn. Congress agreed the Mariner-Jupiter-Saturn project, or MJS, and just before launch, NASA renamed the mission Voyager. Back then, spacecraft failure rates were high, and NASA always built two of each probe in case one failed. These were called Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They also built a third to stay on Earth. Engineers used this one to test procedures before sending instructions to the ones in space. The engineers on the Voyager project were told to design probes to last the four years it would take to visit Jupiter and Saturn. But they didn't always obey instructions. Say a part would cost $1,000 and last five years. Instead, they'd build or order a part for $1,100 that would last 20 years. If they could sneak in a few extra grams of fuel, they would. And the engineers didn't tell management until it was too late. Voyager 1 and 2 were intended to last four years, but they've lasted 45 years and are still going. Here you can see the path of Voyager 2 through the sky from the perspective of Earth. The apparent loops are caused by the Earth orbiting the Sun. Let's look at the design of the spacecraft. Voyager 1 and 2 are essentially identical, with a mass of 773 kilograms. Space probes are built around a bus. This houses the main electronics and holds the rest of the probe together. The bus also includes a data tape recorder. The instruments can gather data much more quickly than they can send it back to Earth, so this magnetic tape stores up to 536 megabits for later transmission. Here is a diagram of the entire probe. The circular dish is the high gain antenna, the largest component at 3.7 meters diameter. This, and the electronics attached to it, send and receive data. There are 16 hydrazine thrusters. This monopropellant fuel was mostly used for trajectory corrections when they passed planets. These days, they are used for just one hundredth of a second at a time to keep the HGA pointed at Earth. Sadly, I can't show you pictures of some of the components, and some I do have at low quality. Back then, NASA wasn't as dedicated to keeping high-quality pictures as they are today. Some low-quality images have been remade by Wikipedians in high quality, like this one. In the outer solar system, far from the Sun, solar panels are too weak, so electricity is supplied by three radioisotope thermal generators. These use the radioactive decay of plutonium-238, which releases alpha particles and provides heat. A thermocouple turns this heat into 470 watts of electric power, or it did. Plutonium-238 has a half-life of 87.7 years, so the RTGs supply much less power than they used to, around 280 watts today and still decreasing. As the power drops below that required for the various scientific instruments, they're taken offline one by one. The most well-known scientific instruments are the Imaging Science System, the cameras, with each craft carrying one wide-angle and one narrow-angle camera. 
Ask your parents what getting film developed means. For now, it's enough to say that Jessops didn't have many branches near Jupiter in the 1970s, so NASA used digital cameras, almost unknown back then. Or rather, they used ordinary analogue TV cameras with an analogue to digital converter. The radio communications system, the Big Dish, was also used for science. By sending a radio signal at a planet, a moon or Saturn's rings and listening for the reflection, we learned a lot about the structure of these objects. An infrared interferometer spectrometer showed us the chemical properties of planetary atmospheres and the nature and size of the particles in Saturn's rings. Combined with an ultraviolet spectrometer, we learned more about the heat flow and radiation produced by the planets. No more pictures for scientific instruments, I'm afraid. The triaxial fluxgate magnetometer investigated the magnetic fields of Jupiter and Saturn and how they interact with the solar wind. A fluxgate is a device that measures flux, the change in a magnetic field from one side of the gate to the other. Triaxial means three axes. There are three flux gates arranged perpendicular to each other, so that they can measure in all three dimensions at once. Thus we can measure the strength and direction of a magnetic field. You have a triaxial flux gate magnetometer in your phone, but a lot smaller than the 5.6 kilogram ones on Voyager. Three systems worked together to investigate particles in the solar system. A plasma spectrometer measures the properties of plasma ions, mostly protons and electrons, and investigated the density and speed of the solar wind. A low energy charged particle detector detected heavier ions, up to element 26 iron, but hid behind the sun shield to protect itself from the high energy ions. And a cosmic ray system let us learn more about the origins and effects of cosmic rays. The largest scientific instrument is the Planetary Radio Astronomy System. This pair of 10 metre long antennae, mounted at right angles to each other, studied radio emissions from the planets. The Plasma Wave System piggybacked on the antennae and mapped the planet's magnetic fields and their interactions with electrons and the solar wind. The last instrument is the Photopolarimeter System. This is a combined telescope, polarizer, and filter and gave us further details on the planets and Saturn's rings. In particular, it let us understand the texture of the planet's upper atmospheres. This summary shows the mass and power requirements of each instrument. As I mentioned earlier, NASA has been gradually shutting down instruments as the power available decreases. The power-hungry cameras were shut down after the probes passed Neptune's orbit, and there weren't any more interesting pictures to take. And the photopolarimeter systems and Voyager 1's plasma spectrometer were taken offline when they failed. Now let's look at the actual missions. Voyager 1 was the main mission, but it actually launched 16 days after the backup Voyager 2 in 1977. However, it was launched at a higher speed and overtook Voyager 2 in the asteroid belt. They reached Jupiter in 1979, studying Jupiter and the four Galilean moons Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto plus Amalthea and several smaller moons. Here we can see Jupiter, a close-up of the Great Red Spot, and the moons Callisto and Io. Here is Jupiter, with Callisto at the lower right. And here is detail of the surface of Ganymede. After getting a speed boost from Jupiter, Voyager 1 and 2 headed to Saturn, arriving in 1980 and 1981. They studied Saturn, its famous rings, and the moons Titan, Tethys, Mimas, Dion, Enceladus, Rhea, Iapetus and Hyperion. These pictures show Saturn, close-ups of Saturn's rings and bands, and Tethys and Enceladus. Here is Saturn, with several moons clearly visible. And here you can see the craters and valleys of Enceladus. We talked earlier about the build quality of the Voyager probes, and both were going strong when the original mission to Jupiter and Saturn was over. And although building and launching a spacecraft is expensive, operating it after launch just needs a few scientists and technicians. NASA used Saturn's gravity to send Voyager 2 onto Uranus, reaching it in 1986. As well as learning a lot about the planet, Voyager 2 discovered 11 new moons. Here we can see Uranus, Oberon, Ariel, Titania, Umbriel and Miranda, plus Uranus's rings. Voyager 2 used the gravity assist from Uranus, plus a course correction from its thrusters, to visit its final planet, Neptune. Voyager 2 remains the only spacecraft to have visited either Uranus or Neptune. It discovered several new moons, 
and made a close approach to Neptune's largest moon, Triton. These pictures show Neptune, a close-up of Neptune's clouds, Proteus, the rings of Neptune, and Triton. The picture of the rings is actually two photos taken from either side, to avoid getting the sun in shot, which would have resulted in an overexposed image. Galileo first saw Saturn's rings through a telescope in 1610, although he didn't know exactly what they were. Christian Huygens recognised them as rings in 1655. But the other planets were thought not to have rings until Voyager 1 found Jupiter's rings and Voyager 2 found Uranus's and Neptune's rings. Actually, Uranus's rings had been detected from Earth a few years earlier, but Voyager 2 took the first actual photos. Although all four giant planets have ring systems, Saturn's are easily the most impressive. After the main mission to Jupiter and Saturn was completed in four years, the mission went into its extended phase. This included Voyager 2's visits to Uranus and Neptune. The last photos were taken by Voyager 1 in 1990, now far above the ecliptic plane. It took a series of photos which, when combined into this mosaic, are called the family portrait, including the Sun and six planets. Mercury was too close to the Sun, and Mars came out too faint to see. It's always difficult gathering the whole family for a photo. The family portrait photo of Earth is now well known as the pale blue dot, less than one pixel wide and only visible because it's so bright. Can you spot it before I point it out? There it is. After this, the interstellar mission began. For years, the spacecraft travelled the outer reaches of our solar system and finally left it, Voyager 1 in 2012 and Voyager 2 in 2018. The Sun is much bigger than the bright disk you see in the daytime sky. Its atmosphere extends to the edge of the solar system, and we call this region the heliosphere. The edge of the heliosphere is called the heliopause, and both voyagers crossed it. Here, we can no longer distinguish the Sun's matter from interstellar matter. The heliopause turns out to be a very sharp cutoff. The protons that Voyager 1 and 2 detected from the Sun dropped from 25 per second to 2 per second in just two months. The Voyager spacecraft were incredibly robust. Voyager 1's thrusters fired in 2017 for the first time since 1980 and worked perfectly. But the RTGs are gradually losing power and are expected to have insufficient power to operate any scientific instruments by 2025. By 2036, the probes will be out of communication range of Earth. Voyager 1 remains the fastest and most distant spacecraft from the Sun. Voyager 2 is the second fastest, and will be the second furthest in 2023 when it overtakes Pioneer 10, the only other spacecraft in interstellar space. In about 300 years they will reach the Oort cloud, taking 30,000 years to pass through it. In 40,000 years, Voyager 1 will encounter Gliese 445. In 42,000 years, Voyager 2 will pass by Ross 248, and in 296,000 years it will encounter Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. But none of these encounters will be particularly close. Voyager 1 and 2 will most likely spend the rest of eternity wandering the Milky Way, monuments to human curiosity and exploration. And finally today, let's look at a gift for any aliens or future humans who discover one of the voyagers. The golden record is a phonograph made of gold-plated copper with an identical copy on each spacecraft. It includes many natural sounds of Earth such as thunder and bird and whale song as well as music from a variety of cultures. There are also photos of humans, creations like architecture and food, mathematical and scientific diagrams, and maps of the Earth's position in the Milky Way. The audio is now on SoundCloud. There are two links in the video description. While you listen, try to figure out how a future alien culture is going to find a phonograph player. Thank you to my wonderful students and everybody who subscribes, watches, and hopefully enjoys my videos. Goodbye, and as always, have an excellent day.